Okay, good afternoon. So this afternoon I'm sharing our presentation from the MABA Winter Conference in 2019. Uh, my name is Karen Renner and the graduate student working on his PhD on this project is Aaron Brooker. And he's also recording a webinar for you that you'll be able to listen to. So the title of my presentation is Cover Crops in Michigan and just talking about interseeding cover crops. And this is a picture here taken in early November last year. And this was showing some radish, tillage radish, that was uh, seeded into uh, corn back in June. So if we think about the farm regions of the United States, Michigan is shown here in purple. And we are considered the northern crescent. And when you think about our climate and our weather, we have a much shorter growing season than other areas of the United States south of us. And that has implications for when a farmer can or cannot seed a cover crop. So Michigan is a really diverse state as far as cash crops go. This is a slide uh, from 2012, but very relevant today, showing you the diversity of crop species across the United States. So if you see a county shown in red, that means that county has very little crop diversity. If you see a county shown in blue, it means very high crop diversity. So when you look at Michigan, we are one of the leading states in crop diversity, actually behind California, and we're a little bit ahead of Oregon, and that goes by crop acres. So when we look at our diversity within our state, and the latest national ag stats are from 2017, even though we're pretty diverse, corn and soybeans still dominate our farmlands. So when we think about fitting a cover crop into our system, many of our farm fields are corn or corn soybeans or corn corn soybean as the rotation. And it's difficult to find a space to fit cover crops into that system. The other pieces of the pie shown here, you can see forages and wheat labeled. And the other smaller pieces of the pie are dry beans, sugar beets, potatoes, and fruit. So corn and soybeans plus forages dominate 75% of our acres. So if we want to increase cover crop use in Michigan for benefits such as managing soil erosion, scavenging nitrogen, maybe contributing nitrogen to the system, if we want any of these benefits and to be on a large acreage across our state, we're going to have to look at potentially seeding into corn or soybean rotations. So we asked, how can we increase cover crop use in Michigan? We know it's a positive thing for soil health. We know it's positive, as I said, for scavenging nutrients. Uh, we know it can be positive for soil health benefits, microbes like a diversity of plants, root systems in the soil. So what are our options in Michigan? So one of our main options that growers are currently utilizing is to seed cover crops in fruit and to also seed cover crops um, before or after vegetable uh, systems to seed in potatoes, cucumbers, dry beans, and sugar beets. And for instance, farmers in sugar beet uh, growing areas have been seeding cover crops for a long time to hold the soil on the sandy knolls across many of the sugar beet growing regions. And our producers of potatoes have been seeding cover crops such as cereal rye for quite a few years after potatoes to also hold the soil. So I list here the various advantages of why someone might want to seed a cover crop. And when we think about the percent of Michigan's farmland in these crops each year, it's around 10%. So then we can think about where else could we add cover crops to Michigan farm systems and one other area we could add cover crops is seeding them when wheat is in the rotation. So 7% of Michigan's farmland each year plus or minus a couple percent there depending on the fall weather that we have and the price of wheat compared to some of our other commodities. We have about 7% of Michigan's farmland that we could seed each year with a cover crop. 
And the ways that we approach that, as many farmers know listening to this, are to frost seed red clover in early spring, sometimes late March, sometimes it's first to April. Some years we struggle to find a window to do that. But farmers have been doing that for many, many years to have red clover growing once the wheat has been harvested and supply a nitrogen credit and hold the soil uh, until the following spring. We have farmers in Michigan that grow sugar beets, uh, seeding cover crop, in particular um, certain brassica species that are trap crops for sugar beet cyst nematode. And there's particular varieties that do that and farmers that grow beets know which ones those are and they seed those following wheat harvest. The sugar beet cyst nematode gets confused. It thinks sugar beets are in the field and uh, it is not able to reproduce on that brassica variety. So we start bringing down sugar beet cyst nematode populations prior to the following year, which is usually farmers planting beets. Farmers also, after wheat, often seed combinations of cover crops. And this has been a trend that's been growing the last five years. Farmers will often seed a grassy cover crop along with the legume such as Austrian pea or a clover, along with the brassica such as kale or a radish. And they'll seed these mixtures in late July, early August. And these mixtures will grow until the time of the very hard first killing frost when anything susceptible to cold weather will die and anything not susceptible will live through the winter. So this is another window that Michigan growers have to seed cover crops and many of them listening or working in the field have been doing the top one for a long period of time. The second one uh, with the sugar beet cyst nematode has probably been more so in the last seven to ten years. And then the bottom bullet about the mixtures after wheat is a trend that is starting to occur probably the last three to four years in Michigan. So these are all great opportunities and now we're at about 17% of Michigan's farmland acres. So when we look at then the percent that's not in alfalfa forage or an alfalfa grass mix forage, we're left with corn and soybean. And that's where if we're gonna make end roads in having more cover crops seeded in Michigan, we have to think about how we can fit cover crops in. So one way that farmers have been approaching that is seeding cereal rye after corn harvest. And often this is after corn silage harvest, which is usually a little bit earlier than corn grain harvest. Another way growers have been tackling this is seeding annual ryegrass, a different grass species, into corn in late summer or fall. And this can be done with an airplane or a helicopter, or it can be done with a high clearance um, spreader. And the third way that farmers could add cover crops into a corn rotation or a corn soybean rotation is they could interseed cover crops into corn in June. So this would mean they would plant corn at their normal planting date. And then when corn reaches a certain stage or height, around anywhere from two collars up to seven collars, when corn gets to that height, then the producer would go in and interseed the cover crops. Those cover crops then sit in the corn, kind of wait until the corn starts to senesce in August and September, and that's when the cover crops really take off and grow. The advantage to this is with interseeding, sometimes that's a good time window. Sometimes in June, that's a, that's a good time frame to get them in because lately in Michigan, our falls have been rather wet and not very conducive to cover crop seeding, let alone getting the cash crop out. So that's why we looked at researching interseeding cover crops in June. There was a lot less information on that, and we were interested in seeing if they would establish which species did well, which species didn't do very well, and to make sure they didn't have any effect on corn grain yield, because that would be the last thing a farmer would want to have happen. So, as I mentioned, it's just another cover crop interseeding window. In the picture here, you see radish on the left. You see some annual ryegrass interspersed throughout the picture. 
And I think I can see one or two small clover plants there. And then you can see the dark green corn leaves coming into the picture. So this is just one window of opportunity. And we were interested if the biomass of the cover crops, in other words, how big they got, both above ground and below ground, if they get bigger than they would if you seeded them in the fall. And bigger is usually better in this case because you have more of a root system scavenging nitrogen and you have more wind erosion protection. And when we think of cover crops contributing to soil organic matter, the more biomass, the better. So this was why we thought this might be a good idea. And we also knew that at this time of year, we could maybe interseed clovers or maybe interseed brassica species. And they might have a longer time to grow through the summer and fall months. And in particular, the brassicas, because those do uh, winter kill, at least the radishes do. So this is what we did. And our research was funded by the Michigan uh, corn growers. It was also funded by Project Green. And it was also funded by USDA through a national grant. So what we did was we interseeded annual ryegrass, um, tillage radish, crimson clover, and then a mixture of the three species into grain corn at various times, uh, beginning in late May and continuing through June. So you can imagine a field with strips, and the whole field is planted to corn. And then you'd go in, let's say, on May 20th, and you'd seed some strips with each of these different cover crops in the mixture. And then you'd go in again, like on May 25th, and seed different strips with the same cover crop seeds in the mixture. And then you'd go in on June 5. So you can get a feel for what these fields look like across the state. So the red stars are the MSU research farms where we worked on. And those, those plots or strips are much smaller, smaller in size. And then the green dots are on farm locations. And these are quite large strips, um, often half a mile long and stripped across the field where farmers were seeding these various cover crops at usually two different times. They targeted V3, which means the corn has three collars. And then the farmers would go back in usually 10 days to two weeks later around V6. And then they would seed the same thing again in different strips. So we had multiple farms looking at this. And then we also looked at this at our two research farms. And then what we do is we go in and we look at um, how big the cover crops get. Did they establish? Um, did they suppress weeds at all? And then we look at corn yield. So these are our, our cover crop interseeding times to give you kind of a feel for what I mean by V2, V3, V4. So this is what the plants look like. And we started interseeding at V2. And then we hit V3, depending on the year and the temperature, three to six days later. And we'd seed other strips at that time. And then we'd wait again till the corn reach V4. And our whole point on this was we were trying to figure out is it okay for a farmer to seed any time from V2 to V7? Or maybe V7 is much better than V2 or vice versa. Because our goal was to provide farmers um, good recommendations on if they were interested in interseeding cover crops, when they should do it or when, when they shouldn't do it. And notice at the bottom of this slide, it says glyphosate was applied just prior to interseeding. So, when we started this, we don't want to have any weeds there when we seed the cover crops. So what we did in this research scenario was we sprayed glyphosate on the strips that were going to get interseeded that day, and then we seeded the cover crop. And then a week later, let's say when we were interseeding at V4, we would spray glyphosate and then seed the cover crop. So we're trying to start with a scenario where there are no weeds there. So we can look at just the effect of the cover crop on corn growth, development, and grain yield. And that's important because you don't want to have a cover crop and weeds in there at the same time. And there's another webinar that Dr. Chrissy Sprague recorded, and it's connected to this, where we looked at various 
pre-emergence and post-emergence herbicides to see what we could apply if we wanted to intercede a cover crop at B3 or at B6. And she completed a webinar on that. And if I was thinking of interceding, I definitely would want to watch that webinar. So I make sure that I'm managing my weeds and I'm also getting good um, establishment of cover crops when I intercede. So these were the seeding rates that we used. And the top line is in pounds per acre, and the bottom line is in seeds per square foot. For me personally, pounds per acre is hard for me to visualize, but if I look and think about a square foot, I get a feel for what that seed number is going to look like per square foot. And as everyone knows, grass seeds are super small and pretty light, so 83 grass seeds per foot, you kind of have a feel what that looks like. And if you've seeded radish seeds before, they're a bigger seed, more of a robust seed. So having seven seeds per square foot makes sense. And then clover is more like a ryegrass seed. And that, we had about 51 seeds per square foot. We came up with these numbers um, talking to growers. We did a survey of cover cropping in Michigan. Um, SARE, the Sustainable Ag Research Education Program, has information. So does the Midwest Cover Crop Council. So we looked at all the different recommendations, talked with farmers, and these are the seeding rates that we came up with. So the types of interseeders that were used are pretty variable. When we're doing small plot work um, on the research farms, we use a handheld broadcast interseeder. Uh, but when we're working on farmers' fields, they have their own equipment. So this is just a couple pictures from a couple of the farms that we um, used or that were helpful with us over the last few years in looking at interseeding. And this is just a couple examples of what they used to intercede. I think on both the top and the bottom picture, you can see kind of the drop tubes. And what's important is that you want to try to get seed soil contact or get that seed down into that soil surface. So a lot of these seeders were, weren't dropping seed from boom height, right? You can see that they're dropping seed from a lower down, so they're getting a spread pattern that they want. So that's what we did. We did this for a three-year period. And what did we learn? So we learned this. And this is one of those great slides that you show at a meeting and people roll their eyes and go, oh my gosh, what is that? So this is what we learned. And this shows the um, emergence of these various cover crop species. So in the ideal world, you would see each of these bars up at 100% emergence. That would mean like for every seed you put down, that seed germinated and emerged and established a plant. So for instance, when farmers plant corn and they're seeding at 35,000 per acre seeds, they expect to have 35,000 plants per acre. When you seed soybeans at 150,000 plants per acre, if you're planting them with a the planter, you expect that many. If you're drilling, you might expect maybe, let's say 130,000. Now think about when you seed wheat, if you seed 1.8 million seeds per acre, how many seeds do you expect or plants do you expect to have established? And with wheat, it's usually around 30 to 40% of those seeds become plants. And with alfalfa, that's pretty similar. When you look at seeding 15 pounds of alfalfa per acre and you switch that over to seeds per square foot and you see how many small alfalfa plants you have established, we're usually at around 40, 40% under ideal conditions. So what about when we broadcast cover crop seed? So if you look at our emergence, annual ryegrass, where we were seeding 80 some seeds per square foot, it's shown in the blue bars and we get about, on average, 20% of those seeds become plants. Now, tillage radish, where we're seeding seven seeds about per square foot, on average, over the years, across all these multiple sites, 
we get about 20 to 25 percent of those plants established, so we get about two radish plants per square foot. When you think about that, that that's okay, okay, because plants like ryegrass will tiller, and tillage radish, um, the leaves get bigger and bigger. So this emergence is okay. What's not okay is the gray bar, the, the crimson clover. Because that, we're seeding 51 seeds, or 50 seeds per square foot. So if you get 20% of those seeds, you should have at least 10 plants per square foot. And you can see we seldom reach that. So our experience with the crimson clover seed across multiple sites in years is that we just don't seem to get good establishment with this broadcast method. What we would need to do to get good establishment of crimson clover is to use an interseeding drill where we drill the seed in just like you would drill alfalfa seed to get better establishment. And in our work, we did not drill. Um, in Pennsylvania, they did drill and they got good establishment. One of the issues with drilling is it's, it's slower and it's not quite the size of the equipment that, and that's somewhat of a concern to some growers that would like to have, you know, 100, 120 foot spread width and be able to, to seed faster. So I'm digressing a bit from the slide, but the take home on this is that we get about 25% annual ryegrass seed emerging, and that's fine. And we get about 20 to 25% tillage radish seed emerging most years, and that's fine and we're not happy with the crimson clover emergence. So in summary here with the clover, as I said, we're only getting about four plants per square foot, shown here on the top line. I don't like that. Um, alfalfa, when we seed it, we're shooting for 92 seeds per square foot, as I mentioned, and we usually get about establishment of about 10 to 12 to 15 plants per square foot after one year. So clover is not working broadcast. We need to drill that in or somehow incorporate that in. So that's my point here on clover. And the bottom line says, yeah, I think we need to drill or at least somehow incorporate that seed in. And some growers have set up almost like a rotary hoe behind their drill, or excuse me, behind their broadcast seeder. So that way it gets some kind of seed soil contact for the crimson clover. The other plants seem to not need this so much. Now, how about how much biomass do we get? Because the more biomass that we get, the more carbon that's going to be added back to the soil and build organic matter. And the more biomass we get, then we're going to have more root system, so that's going to scavenge nutrients more. And the more biomass we get, it's going to protect the soil from erosion. So this is looking like in October and looking at the pounds of dry biomass after you, you dry it down, how much is there per square foot? And you can see that ryegrass has the most biomass of these three cover crop species when measured in October per square foot. And you see radish is second and clover is a distant third across most sites in years. So when you think back to what farmers have been seeding as a cover crop, they've seeded cereal rye after uh, corn silage harvest, and they have seeded annual rye into standing corn um, prior to senescence or at the time of senescence. And you can see why that is a good practice for growers as far as getting biomass for the annual ryegrass. Our goal here was to see if we could have other cover crop species that we could establish, and we found tillage radish worked pretty well. And our goal was also to see if we could establish these two cover crop species back in June when we may have more time versus in August, September, or a wet October. So, yep, we can do it, and it worked decently with the exception of the crimson clover, and as I mentioned, that needs to be drilled to get good establishment. So here's what it looked like in the fall. So on your left, this is annual ryegrass. Uh, Taken, this is probably 
early October to mid-October, just prior to corn harvest. And this is tillage radish on the right. Both of these cover crops were interseeded at V3, V4, and corn back in June. So this looks okay. And you can see in these pictures that we, we had decent weed control here. So we applied glyphosate just prior to the V3, V4 interseeding time. And it controlled any weeds that were there. And then the cover crops emerged and grew. By the time corn reaches usually V3, V4, V5, a lot of the weed seeds that wanted to germinate in the spring are done, okay? As farmers know, as we get later into mid-June and later June, fewer weeds, for the most part, are emerging. So that makes it easier to apply a post material like glyphosate and then plant cover crops and not have weeds continue to emerge. But this is not always the case, and that's why Dr. Sprague's webinar about what herbicides could be used prior to interseeding cover crops is really important to listen to so you can think about how you want to manage weeds if you're interseeding cover crops. I wanted to show you a picture of what clover look like. I, I hate this picture, but I want to show our concerns with the clover. So you can see in the middle of the picture, we have clover there, and you can see other clover at like the bottom right half of the screen, but you see how spindly they are? They, they establish, but they just don't really like it. You can see in the top upper right of the screen, kind of by a piece of corn residue, do you see that clover species? A really long stem, petiole, no, hardly any leaves there. So the crimson clover really does not like that shaded environment in the corn, and it just doesn't prosper. So uh, I would like to be able to seed a legume interseeded into corn, but this one just didn't work for us very well at any of the farm locations or at any of the MSU research farms. So what about corn grain yield? What exactly happened with that? So we have corn grain yield in bushels per acre on the y-axis. So a big bar is good, you know, it'll mean a higher yield. And then we see the different interseeding times along the bottom of the slide beginning at V2. So if you look at the far right of the chart where it says weedy, that's where we let weeds compete with corn. And you can see the yield dropped significantly. It was around 130 bushels per acre when averaged across these multiple sites in years. So weeds at these sites were competitive and had to be controlled. Then you can see we have a treatment where it's weed free. And you can see that yields across these multiple sites in years were over um, 150 bushels per acre. And then you can see with the cover crop seeds that, that uh, wherever we interseeded cover crops, that the yields were similar to the weed-free control. So we don't feel that cover crops reduce corn grain yield. At Missouri and in other states, they've seeded at V4, V5, V6, V7, so has Ontario in recent years. And we're not seeing any corn grain yield losses across other states also. Pennsylvania reported one year when they interceded at V2. So the earliest timing, Pennsylvania reported when they drilled their cover crops in, they had a yield reduction at V2. We have not seen any yield reduction at V2 broadcast. And as I mentioned, no states have reported reductions in yield when cover crops are interseeded at V3 or later. So this is important because a farmer interested in interseeding a grassy cover or a radish brassica type cover into corn does not need to be concerned about corn yields as long as they're interseeding, I would say, at V3 or later. A big caution, though, if they don't have weeds controlled, the weeds are going to reduce grain yield. So it's very important to manage weeds along with managing the cover crop in the system.
So what do we recommend after these three years of work on at MSU, at other universities, and then we've had the farmers across the state that have been super helpful in putting out plots and telling us what they think, what's working, isn't working. So we recommend annual ryegrass or a tillage radish or a mixture of these two species. Could be interseeded beginning at B3 um, all the way up through V7. And we know that drilling, drilling the cover crop seed into corn would improve establishment of the cover crops, but that is limited by corn height, as farmers know, and it is a bit slower operation than broadcast interseeding. One important point I haven't mentioned to date that is important is that grass seed should be probably 20% less of the mixture. And the reason for that is grass is very competitive with radish, uh, with clover. So if you have too much grass seed there, it's awesome, it'll, it'll grow great, but you're not gonna have your other species establish. So ourselves and recent research into other states, we all support that that grass seed by weight should be 20% or less of a mixture. The fourth thing we learned that's super important is you have to have rain to get the cover crop seed to, to germinate. And we all know that. We all know if we plant corn or beans and there's no rain and we don't plant into moisture, that seed's gonna sit there until it rains. Well, the same thing with cover crop seeds. So we had one year, I think it was 2015, where we had about a half an inch of rain every week from mid-May through June. That was 2015, I, I remember it. And in 16, 17, and 18, that didn't happen. As growers have been experiencing in our state, we're getting periods of dry weather, sometimes two weeks, three weeks long, and then we'll get uh, heavy rainfall for two days. So what we've learned is if a farmer's planning on interseeding cover crop, I wouldn't really decide V3, V4, V5, V6, V7. I would just watch the weather, and when there's rain coming, that would be when I would interseed, because that would allow that cover crop seed to take in the water and germinate and emerge. So rainfall after seeding is just critical. And lastly, weed control is important. I've mentioned that before, and in our research, we would apply glyphosate just before we seeded the cover crop. And that controlled all the weeds that were up. But you want to also have weed control prior to cover crop seeding. And putting a pre-emergence down is a good weed resistance management strategy. And that's why we looked at various herbicides that a grower could use and interseed annual ryegrass or interseed radishes or a combination of the two. And that's in Dr. Sprague's webinar. We also have an extension fact sheet that's being published about interseeding cover crops and herbicide recommendations. Just a couple other points. Um, I know that by being on farm across the state uh, for a few years, we learned a lot. Uh, one thing we did learn is it doesn't really work well to try to interseed cover crops in 22 inch rows or narrower rows. I know our beet producers in the state, about 40% of our sugar beets or maybe more are on 22 inch rows. And if the corn is on that same row spacing, this does not work very well because the corn canopy closes so quickly. Um, it is difficult for any light and also rainfall to reach that soil surface. So for those growers, um, seeding in the fall after the corn uh, canopy has senesced is probably still the best approach. We also noticed that when we tried to interseed corn populations that were above 38,000, cover crops also struggled to establish. It's a similar to the row spacing issue. When you have a dense corn canopy pretty quickly, the light doesn't penetrate to the soil surface, nor does the rainfall unless it's a very, very, very driving rain. So we have found that for farmers that are interested in interseeding, the 30,000 or 32,000 corn populations really improve establishment. 
And we saw that farmers that were seeding 28,000 to 30,000, and sometimes even a little lower on lighter ground, had very good establishment of the cover crops. We found also that early maturing hybrids uh, increase cover crop growth in the fall months, and that makes sense. So if a farmer's planting 100 day corn, that's gonna dry down or snus earlier in the fall, and that gives the cover crops a lot of opportunity to grow in the fall. At the farmers uh, at 110 day, that's almost, well, it's 10 or almost two weeks, sometimes longer, that that corn canopy is there, and that reduces cover crop growth in the fall. And lastly, we also observed that north-south rows are better for light interception, and others have commented on this over the years when looking at establishing cover crops. So what we are researching right now is different seeding rates. Does it really change cover crop biomass? And we plan to report on that next year at the Michigan Ag Business Conference and through webinars. And we also are looking at cover crop mixtures. Uh, we're trying to figure out good mixtures for producers that are interested in doing a mix and what the ratio of those should be. We have mixtures that we're interseeding into corn and also seeding after wheat. And we have another research project where we look at cover crop seeding on rolling ground and taking a look at how those uh, depressions versus the summits versus that slope, how that influences establishment and also growth of these various cover crop species. So I want to thank you for listening today. And this research was funded by, as I said, Project Green and the Corn Marketing Program of Michigan, also the United States Department of Ag. And we strongly, strongly appreciate the cover crop seed companies contributing to the work and helping us as we process this information. Thank you.